Good afternoon, everyone. Wow, what a what a great crowd. Um, this is exciting. I feel like I hit the bell better uh, this time than I did at the at the uh, picnic. So for those of you that weren't there, you missed it. I'm sorry. Um, welcome to the September 22nd meeting of the Brentwood Rotary Club, Rotary Club of Brentwood, rather. Uh, my name is Drew Rogers, and I have the privilege of serving as the president this year. Oh, thank you, Kerry. <laughs> You can do that at every meeting, Curry. Thank you. Um, I do have the privilege of serving as the president of this club. We have a great program for you today, and we have a full agenda. We have quite a few uh, guests. So, Dr. McQueen, they're all here to hear from you. So, that's a lot of pressure, but uh, it's going to be great. I know it's going to be a very informative program, and we're very fortunate and grateful to have you here. Uh, our invocation will be led by Rod Freeman, and the pledge and four way test will be led by Jane Covington. So, Rod. Before Rod comes uh, to the microphone, I did want to mention uh, Ted Elanchilian and I spoke uh, just this morning. He mentioned that he broke his ankle uh, hiking in the Grand Canyon. So as we do um, uh, start the invocation, I hope that you'll keep his recovery in your prayers. So thank you. He was on Zoom. All right, so join me with a prayer, please. Please. Well, we just uh, thank you for this opportunity to gather as a group, gather as Rotarians. Uh, practice our motto of service above self. We just, uh, we're very fortunate people to not only be in this club, but to live in this community, and we're thankful for that. Uh, we're, uh, we want to remember Ted uh, and, and others in our club that uh, have health issues and that can't join us today. Uh, also want to remember uh, Rotarians who have uh, spouses that they're looking after, and, uh, and, and, and they need our prayers, they need your comfort uh, ask that you put your arms around them and comfort them uh, during this season uh, of their of their life. Uh, we thank you for the food that we're uh, we've enjoyed and will continue to enjoy. We thank you for this program that we're about to hear, um, and we just thank you for your Son Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Now, please join me in the pledge to the flag of the greatest nation in the world. I pledge allegiance. Flag. United States of America. It stands one nation under God, indivisible, liberty and justice for all. And now for the four way test of the things that we think, say, and do as Rotarians. Number one. Number two. Number three. Four. Sorry. And <laughs> thank you, Rod, and thank you, Jane. Um, before uh, Jennifer Bourne introduces our guests and visiting Rotarians, I will um, mention to all of those that are visitors here today, this is our 50th anniversary. So we have been a club for 50 years. Uh, this year is our 50th anniversary. We're very proud of it. Thank you. Thank you, Linus. Um, and as we do, we think back to, uh, excuse me, let's be quiet. Children, can we be quiet, please? Uh, excuse me, please, thank you. Now we can get on with introducing our guests and visiting Rotarians, Jennifer Bourne. Sorry, I thought you were still corralling attention. I was. Okay. <laughs> All right, first, we've got a lot of guests today, so please bear with me. Steve is going to introduce his first. And my guest was the one talk. <laughs> this is Steve Tate. I've known him about 15 years. I uh, went to church together, we've done bike riding together. He's in the insurance world. And uh, he used to be a Rotarian at the Donaldson Club a while back. So, anyway, Steve Tate. Welcome, Steve. <laughs> if you're having a good time, you can keep talking. No worries. All right, I have an old college roommate who graduated from college with me at Lipscomb, and I thought he might have an interest in the program today, Joey Harwell. Welcome, Joey. All right, Becky, would you like to introduce your guest? All right, my guest is Jackson Matheson. Uh, we met at one of the other club meetings. Um, a lot of different things I go to, but he is in the financial world. This is the first time he's ever been to a Rotary meeting. So. Most fun Rotary Club meeting that you'll have attended. I can assure you that. 
Sure. Yeah, you can see them. Uh, I have the privilege to introduce uh, three people here. So we got uh, Banks Hickman and Joshua Jarvis. They're from uh, Jarvis Tree Experts. And we got to chat before. And Josh is a Rotarian uh, in outside of Atlanta. Um, he's been in Alpharetta well, 15, 13, 16 years or 13 years. Okay. And he kind of said a cool story. His previous boss uh, wouldn't allow him to join Rotary. So he just quit and join and start his own company so he could join Rotary, <laughs> which I thought it's awesome. It's like, it's a great way to do it. Uh, and then of course, Banks has been here a few times. So welcome back and appreciate that. And then next uh, is Jay Kloss. He's from uh, Florence, Alabama, former Rotarian. Uh, him and his wife are in commercial real estate. So we got a ch uh, chat on Monday and love your energy and told us about uh, a hands-on Nashville. That is kind of a cool volunteer. So we might be able to talk with our volunteer uh, committee and get in touch with that. So thanks a lot, Jay. Wonderful. Thank you guys. All right. And we have some other guests that are here and I don't know where they all are. Um, Matt McCall. I saw him. Um, he is, has submitted a proposal for membership. Tim Elder right here also proposal for membership. And then we have two that are getting inducted today. We're, oh gosh, hurry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm skinny, but woo. Um, here's Owen. Owen and Pauline. So they are getting they're getting inducted today. So we also have one right here. Doesn't Forgot feel like a guest. Is a former. He's not a guest. That's right. He's, <laughs> thank you. Welcome, Jeff. Jeff used to be a member of our club, and um, and we're so happy to see you again. Um, and and you are a guest of our speaker, correct? This is Lindsay. She is a guest of our speaker. Wonderful. Did I miss anybody? I lot. think it's covered. It's so exciting that you guys are all here today. Welcome to each of you. Thank you for joining our club. Um, we hope that you have a good time. Um, and I promise I won't shush anyone else again. Um, okay, a few announcements uh, before we get into a, a couple of things that are always a lot of fun for us, and that's introducing new members to our club. Um, remember, that uh, Waverly, our day for Waverly is coming up on October 7th. So uh, there's been a challenge with getting enough volunteers to, to show up for the Waverly food drive. Um, I know a number of us have uh, signed up. October 7th, if you need to know how to sign up, I think Hunter, Beth, um, Warren should be able to help you with that. But please sign up and show up on October 7th. Uh, there will be an email coming um, that to remind you that that's actually coming on the 7th of October. Uh, remember that there are no credit card payments that can be made online after September 30th. So you have outstanding invoices. Um, if you want to make those payments online, make it before September 30th. After that, we're going to have people here that can take credit card payments. But until then, if you really just want to avoid people and you want to make it online, do it before September 30th. Um, uh, I do have a Paul Harris Fellow uh, recognition to, to make today. I saw him come in earlier. Um, and so before we get into introducing our new uh, members, I'd like to call Mark McFerrin up um, to the podium because Mark has achieved Paul Harris Fellow plus three. Mark, congratulations. Um, I have, I don't see Dick Bowers here, do I? I don't. Okay. Well, we will catch him later. Um, okay. Now we get to introduce new members. Um, so I'm going to ask Beth Dormany and Colleen Atwood to come to the podium. Beth. Oh, that was close. Okay, I was drafting this and trying to keep it to like under 10 minutes. So bear with me, but there's a lot to say about uh, Colleen Atwood. So good afternoon. Um, it's my privilege today to formally introduce to you Colleen Atwood for membership. I will begin by briefly telling you about some of her professional experience and accolades, but then I'd like to talk to you a little bit more about her personal uh, attributes that I believe is the reason it makes her, is going to make her an outstanding Rotarian. Colleen is a class of 77 graduate of Miami University in Oxford, Ohio. Don't let that fool you though, because she's a big OH fan. Yeah, 
You'll see her in all of her stuff during football season for sure. She graduated with her Bachelor's of Environmental Design from the School of Architecture and currently holds licensures in 48 states as well as the District of Columbia. Colleen is certified by the National Council of Architectural Registration Boards and is a longstanding member of the International Code Council and the National Fire Protection Association. She's a member of the Miami University Alumni Association and just completed her term in serving as an advisory board member for the College of Creative Arts. While attending Miami, she was an active member of the Delta Zeta sorority and continues to support the sisterhood through the Delta Zeta Foundation and Guy Potter Benton Society, which awards scholarships to young women in recognition of their academic excellence and financial need. Upon graduation, Colleen moved to Nashville, Tennessee to embark on a lifelong career in commercial architecture, following an internship um, and professional employment with Edwards and Hotchkiss. Um, she joined design and engineering in 1992, where she later became the principal shareholder and officer and served as vice president until 2019. After mentoring a new generation of junior architectural associates, she turned the reins of the firm over to them to pursue her retirement. But dot, 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 that didn't last long. With the demand for her expertise didn't stop. Well, with her stepping back from her firm, clients from across the U.S. began reaching out to her to continue her design practices. And so then she formed Sea Forward Architecture, which affords her the opportunity to reduce her pace and workload while still remaining relative in the commercial architectural industry. Colleen's fusion of creativity and efficient solutions has afforded her the opportunity to become a leader and expert in the world of commercial restaurant design and hospitality. And I had the privilege the other day of counting and going through some of her portfolio and doing a deep dive to see how many brands she had worked with. But um, it was astounding. It was over 75 brands across the U.S. But you'd never know it, some of which she has served for nearly four decades. Her expertise isn't limited to commercial restaurant design. However, one of her most favorite projects was a hotel she designed in the Cayman Islands. So you'll have to talk to her about that sometime when you're sitting at her table. It's a very exciting story, and I promise you'll be jealous by the end of the conversation. <laughs> um, she has an unwavering sense of patriotism, and she credits a strong upbringing by a father who served as a captain in the United States Air Force in conjunction with the history of family members who currently have served or do serve in the military dating all the way back to the American Revolution. It was no surprise when the opportunity presented itself in 2013 that Colleen welcomed the opportunity to sponsor and chaperone three World War II veterans on an honor flight um, mission trip to DC. Um, and she quotes, it was an experience of a lifetime. Colleen's engagement in our local community provides a pillar of support and organizations that include Safe Haven, Gilda's Club, Friends of Radnor Lake, the Gary Sinise Foundation, Middle Tennessee Girl Scouts, the Nashville Zoo, the Ronald McDonald House, the local police, the firefighters, and our first responders. And that's just to name a few. Uh, Colleen finds great pleasure by fulfilling her passion for the arts through her participation and fellowship as a member of the Tennessee Performing Arts Center Applause Society, the Director Circle for the First the Frist Center for the Visual Arts, the Cheekwood Botanical Garden and Museum of Art Society, the Nashville Symphony Golden Baton Society, and the founding class of governing members. And this is where I stick my tongue out because it's <laughs> there's so many things. And I was just trying to just name just a couple so you get a sense of who she is um, and the character behind her and the things she's involved in in our local community. But now that we've talked about some of her professional accolade, accolades and her charitable involvement, I wanted to share with you just a couple of my personal experiences behind closed doors. Um, I've watched, I've worked with her for over 20 years. I've watched her behind closed doors between clients, architects, engineers, attorneys, bankers, all seeking a resolution over a challenging project in the wings. And without doubt, not even for a second, did anyone leave the room not thinking that they were in dealing with an architect with integrity, professionalism, and outstanding character. Always putting the needs of herself aside, she looked out for her entire staff, both professionally and their families. And during, I am going to give you just a couple examples. During the global crisis, uh, financial crisis of 2008, she put her own salary and her bonuses and everything aside to be sure that she ensured 
her entire staff that no one was laid off. That's just one example. There was another example of a single mom who came to me later. Um, we were at a mutual party where she had told everybody that she was diagnosed with cancer, wasn't sure how she was going to pay her bills. And um, she came to me like maybe a few months later and said, did you know that Colleen Atwood after that meeting came up to me and said um, privately, you know, may I carry your, your house note for a year so you can just focus on your recovery and, you know, just scrambling by on your utilities. There's example after example like that. And um, there's examples of children in the inner city with needs and homeless families that she's trying to house and um, food bank drives and you name it. And also many of you have also had a chance to serve with her now when she's accompanied us, accompanied us on numerous trips to Waverly. So I know that a few of you have gotten to know her that way also when we've all been crammed in back seats of everyone's car trying to get there. But um, if you ever saw uh, watching her, I'm almost done. <laughs> Watching her win numerous professional awards and accolades over the years, you would never know any of it. She doesn't wear them. She doesn't speak about them. And you might would pass her and say, hey, I hear you, des I hear you design restaurants. And she would say to you, oh, one or two. You know, you'd never know what she's done because that she's so humble. But she's a woman of character. She's a woman of her word. She is a truth seeker. She is a woman of integrity. She's loyal. She's dependent. She's intentional in her giving. She radiates kindness. And she's just plain old fun. And um, the thing is, Colleen's been doing Rotary her whole life. She's just never been labeled. So today we get to get rid of that and we get to put a label on her. So please welcome Colleen Ward Atwood. Beth, thank you. And Colleen, welcome. We're glad you're here. Um, I get the privilege of introducing Owen, and I can assure you that um, my introduction is not going to be nearly what uh, what Colleen got. So my apologies in advance of of um, that it's not going to be adequate. But I have long thought that I was the youngest Rotarian uh, to have joined the Rotary Club of Brentwood when I joined at 26. But but that's going to be beaten today. Um, our newest Rotarian, Owen Zadunsky, uh, beat me by a year, joining us at the age of 25. But but like Colleen, he's been a Rotarian all of his life. He just hasn't been labeled as such. Uh, he has a legacy of Rotary behind him as his grandfather uh, was a member of the Erie, Pennsylvania Rotary Club for 40 years. I believe I said that right. Erie? Right. Um, and that shaped his view of serving a club like ours. And since he's come in, he came in through the website, he's joined me at the at the table here, and I've gotten to know him really well. And, and you can see that his grandfather's experience in Rotary has shaped his view of, of our club and what it means to serve in a club like ours. He has a fascinating background that I hope you'll get to know. He moved to Middle Tennessee about 14 years ago uh, when his father relocated to establish a presence here for Erie Insurance. But following his freshman year at Ravenwood, his love for hockey took him to prep school at, in Indiana at Culver Military Academy, which is just west of Fort Wayne, where he starred as the goalie on the school's hockey team and then moved on to the State University of New York Cortland campus, where he served in a similar position on that school's hockey team. He's now the principal agent at Brentwood Insurance Group, which is located over uh, by the Target on Old Hickory Boulevard. Uh, it's an independent insurance agency where he provides auto, home, life, and business insurance coverage to meet his customers' needs. He has taken shots from the Predators as a practice player, and I'm sure that he has many more stories that I haven't gotten to hear, but I hope that you'll come and meet him and get a chance to hear them from yourself. So please join me in welcoming Owen to our club. All right, um, Owen, welcome. Colleen, welcome. We're so glad that you're here and, and part of our club. I'm going to ask Michael Hyman to uh, give us happy bucks real quick. Thank you very much. I remember in, when I joined, I think my introduction was, oh, by the way, we have a new member. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right, right here, Sheila. Give her the microphone. Okay, the first the first dollar is I'm very upset that I'm not going to be at the Waverly distribution because that's one of my favorite things to do. The second one is because that's the day my oldest daughter gets married. Oh. Nice. Congratulations. Okay, so I have two five dollar bills. Number one, because I didn't have any ones. But um, so for this first five dollar bill is for Rotary and their 50th anniversary. That's amazing. Um, and also, it is because of 
Mr. Greenup's birthday today because um, he's having his 39th birthday for the second time. So make sure you wish him happy birthday. Happy birthday. Yes. And then my second um, is because I have had the absolute best week of my life, specifically yesterday. Some of you know, and it's not me being dramatic, just so y'all know. Some of you know that my mom has been diagnosed with uterine cancer. Um, it's been very hard for the family. We've been trying to figure out what does that look like? Um, she's down in Orange Beach. You know, do the doctors know what they're doing? We, they do, but it's just different. We brought her up to Vanderbilt. Orange Beach said that she had stage 3B uterine cancer, which is bad. B is bad, just so everybody knows. Going through Vanderbilt the last four weeks, we found out yesterday that she, Vanderbilt does not think the same as Orange Beach. They think that it's stage one. So for me, great week, best week of my life. So grateful. And just want to tell everybody that wonderful to be a Rotarian. And thank you wonderful. for your prayer. It's great news. These uh, two bucks is totally inadequate, but I am delighted to see Joey Harwell here. Joey and I worked together many, many years ago and have remained friends. So welcome, Joey. Welcome, Joey. <laughs> Sarah, Sarah doesn't know it, but uh, one of her dollars uh, went in for me. Um, the uh, This week, I'm, I'm excited. My grandson is a high school senior, and tomorrow he and I are flying to Houston where I'm going to show him around Rice University, introduce him to Rice, and introduce Rice to him. No pressure, but if he, if, if they come to some mutual agreement, he will be the fourth generation and the ninth family member to go there. Wow. Wow. We'll bill you for the actual cash. I just want to say I was happy to see Jeff Magruder. I didn't recognize him at first. He's got some growth on his chin there and the other thing when you were talking about ar and that kind of stuff and uh, making payments uh, you forgot to tell them that guido from detroit will be making a visit to your home <laughs> yeah he might look like rod freeman with a baseball bat i had a whole speech to, to tell you but i left it in the car but uh, this is uh, this is uh, a five dollar bill because i didn't have a one i did <clears throat> no uh -uh. We, we've just had our fourth grandchild, and he is, now I haven't been here for a while, so he's already 16 years old. <laughs> no, he's four weeks old now. Congratulations, Chuck. Just because he put more money in doesn't mean you can say more things, Michael. Um, I want to say thank you and also give a little bit of a shameless plug. Thank you to Jared and Curry for contributing to the Brentwood High um, baseball fundraiser. So thank you. If anybody else wants to participate and be a sponsor in our golf tournament, that'd be great. Um, but I'm really excited to share this and a little bit surprised and terrified along the way. Um, we're expecting, but not like that. We're expecting a boy and a girl that we're going to adopt um, that are 14 and 10. So I'm going to have five children. That's amazing. So I have uh, two dollars to put in. One, um, I'm really happy to have two new members, um, and no disrespect to you, Owen, but I'm just really glad that we have another Buckeye in in the club. So I think our our quality just went up a little bit. Um, and then the other dollar is going to be on behalf of Alan because I just want him to he hear him to talk crap about Tennessee for the <laughs> last week. So uh, yeah, Alan can have that. Congratulations. Wow. That's cool. All right. So how many like Chick-fil-A? I like yeah. Chick-fil-A. A lot of you have the app. Here's an easy way to love on my Barefoot Republic. We we were given a $30,000 grant. Yay. Hey. For scholarship kids for our camp. And we were nominated as one of their true inspiration organizations. So there's like five of us in the Atlantic area. And based on how many votes we get, we could earn up $200,000 more grant. I mean, it's huge. So between now and midnight tomorrow, if you want to go to your app or download it, it's easy under the news section, 
under rewards. You can find us there. You can vote once, only once. And then the other thing tonight or today, two of my friends put together a, a true movie called I Can. I Can. It's about a, a young girl that was born with just one arm and went on to play college softball on a scholarship. And it's her inspirational story and parents. It's really, it comes out today. It's called I Can. Nice. So I'm going to embarrass uh, Jordan. Jordan Nilsson got engaged this weekend. So She's so excited. Congratulations. Congratulations, Jordan. Anybody else? This was a happy group. Happy group. Happy group. Well, I got. One dollar to express my appreciation for Rod Freeman and Roger Freeman for giving me a ride home for early. So I wouldn't be able to make a meeting about that. And uh, the uh, the second one is for Utah beating Baylor last week. There you go. Go Utes. Congratulations. Um, anybody else? Wonderful. Rod Freeman's cheaper than Uber. My, Michael, thank you very much. I appreciate your help. Now, without further ado, uh, I would like to welcome Bert Bradford to the podium to introduce our speaker, Dr. Candace McQueen. Bert. You can move this up if you need to. Uh, our speaker today is Dr. Candace McQueen, and she has this long bio, but in the interest of time, I want to get her up here. Uh, Dr. McQueen began her tenure at Lipscomb as the 18th president in September of 2021. She has more than 20 years experience in education, spanning the classroom, higher education, leadership, and state government and nonprofits. Prior to her appointment to Lipscomb, Dr. McQueen was CEO of the National Institute of Excellence and Teaching, national nonprofit founded by the Milken Institution Education Foundation to encourage incentive teachers in excellence in states, districts, and university and classrooms across the country. From 2015 to 2019, Dr. McQueen served as the Tennessee Commissioner of Education under former Governor Bill Haslam. In this rule, Dr. McQueen collaborated with over 147 school districts, hundreds of non-public charter schools to serve the 1 million students in the state of Tennessee. During her tenure, Tennessee saw its highest graduation rates, ACT scores, post-secondary attendance and investments in teacher salaries in the state's history of public schools. Dr. McQueen has a Bachelor of Science from Lipscomb University, a Master of Education in School Administration from Peabody slash Vanderbilt, and a PhD from the University of Texas, Austin. She is also an alum of Leadership Tennessee, Leadership Nashville, and Chiefs for Change. She serves on the boards of the Pencil Foundation, United Way, and the National Institute in Excellence in Education. Will you welcome Dr. Candace McQueen? Well, good afternoon. It's great to be with you. I um, am thrilled to do a fast track through um, some things about Lipscomb. So I hope you'll stick with me and then I'll, I'll open it up to questions. I first would love a show of hands. How many of you are Lipscomb grads or went to Lipscomb at some point? Okay, fantastic, fantastic. And I want to say a special hello to Richard Dickinson and Sid Smith. If you want stories on them, we go to church together so I can tell you some good stories, particularly Sid. I know, I know, I know. But it is great to be here, and I want to say a special thanks to Jeff Magruder for being here. He's a new board member at Lipscomb University, so thrilled to have you you here as well. Um, so let me first just share a little bit about who we are at Lipscomb. Uh, we're a campus now that, if you look from an aerial view, uh, we have really expanded even over the last decade um, on the footprint that used to be David Lipscomb's farm. He was a man who, if you read much about him, you will learn that he had this big heart for higher education. And he started a Bible school on October 5th, 1891. You may say, well, was that a school to train preachers? And actually it wasn't. 
It was a school to train people in all types of vocation, doctor, teacher, working in the financial sector, but to be someone who had Christ at the center of their work and to actually live their faith through their profession. And so it's great to be in a place that are, where the mission hasn't changed. 133-ish years, uh, we are a place that continues to train people in all types of professions to keep Christ at the center of who they are, but to be exceptional doctors and teachers and folks in the financial sector and so on. And we've expanded to so many degrees where I'll tell you a little bit about that too. This is an aerial view of our campus. Uh, we just had a master planning process uh, that just took place that you go through every 10 years. And we continue to think about expansion on our campus because of our growth. So I'll talk a bit about uh, our growth. But first I wanna share that we are a campus that also has a two-year-old through 12th grade campus. Uh, so we have one campus that's right there where we are between Granny White and Belmont. And we also have a campus, our lower school and our Solly school that's down the road uh, on Harding. Uh, we are a very interesting place. We serve literally two-year-olds all the way up through PhD candidates. Uh, that's very unique. There's only about a handful of schools in the country that would have that kind of span in terms of one educational community. Uh, what I love about that is that we can really think creatively about how do you ensure that education is a, is a spectrum uh, that doesn't stop at high school? What does it look like if you were forgetting that it doesn't really stop, it continues? And we have students every year from the academy that come on to the university or certainly go other places. And many of them have 30, 35 college credits because they've been able to come over and do dual enrollment uh, for three of their four years of high school. And that continues to grow as we think about uh, the cost of higher education. Coming to Lipscomb Academy, you can get dual enrollment credits at 30, 35, 36 dual enrollment credits, uh, which really sets you up well to be past your sophomore year or when you go in, into college. I also want to share about who we are today. This is a great picture of a burgeoning campus right in the center of our uh, student center and one of our auditoriums, Collins Alumni Auditorium. We have close to 6,000 students total. If you take our academy that has about 1350, it's one of the larger public, uh, private schools in the city of Nashville and in Middle Tennessee. And then we have a campus of about 2,800, 2,850 undergraduate students, and then almost 2,000 students. We're not quite there, about 1,850 uh, students that are at our graduate level. And so the campus continues to grow. We had our largest enrollment ever in terms of first time freshmen this year and our largest graduate enrollment. The only group that we were really down in this year was transfer students. And if you look at the data on transfer students, transfer students are down because more and more students are making a decision not to go to a community college. Meaning our community colleges were down this past year. Some of them locally down about 19% of students. That's not good for any of us. Uh, we need students to make a post-secondary choice. Uh, they need to go somewhere, get a certification, get a credential, get a degree. And the less that we have go into community colleges, the less ultimately make a decision to go to a four-year and the less qualified workers that we have. And so we really care about making sure our community colleges are strong too and have strong relationships with them across um, the city. I do want to share a bit about our programs. Um, our programs just recently received some great rankings uh, we are the number 12th top Christian university in the country, according to two different rankings that just came out. Lipscomb Academy just got their ranking today, and they're the number one Christian school in Middle Tennessee, according to the niche.com rating that just came out. And so nationally, uh, the university level continues to grow in our national status, our rankings, and certainly we do at Lipscomb Academy level two. Our programs are where it really differentiates us. We are a Christian university and our mission is at our core. It is who we are and we ensure that that mission is clear and strong and that we align to it. But some folks will say, well, if you're a Christian school, aren't you less in terms of quality? I had a parent ask me that one time. I said, absolutely not. Your faith calls you to be excellent in all things. And we wanna show that excellence in every program that we have. So as far as a Christian university, we of our size, we have the most national accreditations of any Christian university our size or even a thousand students more. 
We have 22 national accreditations for programs at the undergraduate and national, excuse me, at the graduate level. And those programs, first and foremost, are in some burgeoning new programs. Uh, one of our top programs is animation. We are the number one animation program in the state, uh, number 22 in the country, because we compete with California in animation. But we hired two Disney animators a couple of years ago. They happened to be twins. And the twins were the animators on Lion King and Pocahontas, uh, the big ones, the big Disney movies. And they are now teaching at Lipscomb. And they're teaching our students to become um, digital professionals in film and in media. The other um, prop top program that has come out of, of some of these conversations has been around digital production, commercial music. Uh, we're starting to really compete uh, with some of our friends down the street on music business even. Um, and that has been a really boon for our College of Entertainment and the Arts. Commercial music, music, songwriting, and certainly what we're doing in animation and digital production. Anybody know the Veggie Tales? We also have on our faculty the voice of Larry the Cucumber. So Mike Naraki, who was Larry the Cucumber, also works at Lipscomb. So it's great to have folks that were from the faith-based entertainment uh, also come uh, alongside some of our Disney animators as well. Uh, we're also a place that this past year um, had some great news with our College of Business for the ninth year. Uh, we have been ranked number one on the Poet and Quants rating for our College of Business. Marketing, management, finance degrees, uh, all of those degrees continue to do very well for us, and we have strong MBA programs. You can take online, you can take in a hybrid format, or you can take face-to-face. Uh, -face. We're adding cybersecurity uh, certifications that would go along with uh, the work that you're doing on your MBA this next year and have already gotten great interest in that program as well. And then because my background is education and I started at Lipscomb as a faculty member in education, ultimately was the Dean of the College of Education, I'm proud of how our College of Education really is the most reputable in the state for putting out strong teachers. And we have a burgeoning leadership group in both our EDD program and our PhD program. Uh, we are still the number one best college of education in the state according to the state teacher prep report card. And we just started a PhD program this past year. We hoped to have 10 students. Uh, we have 19 that joined that cohort. And we also have two educational doctorate cohorts. The PhD program is more for folks who want to go on a research path. And the EDD path are for people who want to be more practitioners. They want to be a superintendent of schools, potentially, or they want to be a principal. Um, and so those paths have really opened up a continuing opportunity for training educators. And then I'm thrilled to share this uh, past spring, it was actually in May, we were awarded a $4.8 million grant from the federal government to train school counselors, specifically with an emphasis in mental health needs of our students. Uh, we know how important that is, and this will open up about 60 to 80 school counselors, not only in Nashville, but in Williamson County, Sumner County, Montgomery County, uh, Murray County, all will have the ability to be trained to be a school counselor with this niche and this depth in mental health counseling. You may say, well, don't all school counseling programs already do that? The answer is no, and particularly not to the depth that we really need in our school districts today. At the same time, about two weeks later, uh, we received news that we had also received a $1.68 million grant that is to train counselors, not just school counselors, but counselors with a better emphasis and depth in mental health. And so we're known in both of our programs that are at the education level and in school and counseling general about our, our prowess and our ability to train in the medical health um, emphasis. And then I did wanna mention our School of Communication. Those are, are great folks. You might recognize the person in the middle with the sunglasses on, that's Demetria Kaladimos. Do y'all remember her? Channel 4 um, television broadcaster in Nashville for a really, really long time. She was our visiting professor for uh, this past year. And I'm proud to say this group of students won the Edward R. Morrow National Award uh, for a piece that they did about the guitar-shaped sounds sign. So if you've been to a sounds game and you've seen the guitar-shaped sign, they did a national story about that sign. It's a fantastic story. And they were one of only eight we we're only one of eight schools in the country that won this award. And so Demetria and our team 
are going to New York here in a few weeks to, to gather that award. We have a great school of communications and bring in practitioners, people who've really done the work to continue to serve as visiting professors with us. And then I do want to share a bit about our student research because folks don't know this about Lipscomb and we've got to tell the story. Uh, we're, according to Forbes, the number two, and I'll tell you who number one is, the number two university in the state doing student-led research. Number one is Vanderbilt. Uh, we have expanded what we do in student research because we feel like at our institution, if you're really going to be strong academically, students need to be asking those big questions, the deep questions, and then testing to see what those answers are right beside faculty members, whether they're an undergraduate or a graduate student. And so we've expanded where almost 400 of our students at the undergraduate level do student level research that they then present at a spring symposium that we do every year. At the graduate level, almost everyone's doing research of some kind. And so our work in student research is very high level and we continue to put out um, magazines every year that share a bit about the research that our students are doing, not just faculty. And so we hope if you'd want to get that research magazine to see what we're doing in pharmacy and health sciences and arts in research, um, that you'll subscribe to that. And then I heard you mention Waverly. So I, I did want to mention the work that we have done to continue to support folks who uh, are homeless in Waverly post floods um, some time back. Our engineering students, um, and this is, I believe, the second micro home they have built. Um, they will build micro homes that are now being donated to a farm in Waverly where folks are living that continue to be without homes post flood. Uh, this was one built by our freshmen. And they have some common facilities that they use on the farm. And then they have the micro homes that they, they sleep in and that they stay in. I'm very proud of our, our engineering school. We have a portion of our engineering school called the Peugeot Center. And it ensures that every single student, which is a differentiator for engineering, every student has either a domestic or international mission experience at least twice while they're a student. That means our students are building clean water systems in Honduras. Uh, they're, clean, they're creating medical waste of centers in Guatemala. They're building prosthetic limbs for veterans or for kids that have lost limbs and accidents. So they're using their engineering skill set into some kind of service component while they're a student. And what we're seeing is now that we've done this six, seven, eight, nine years, we're going back to the same places. And I'm proud that I'm gonna be able to go with many of them in May to see multiple sites that they use in Honduras to help folks uh, with their engineering skill set. And so it's a, a great win if you wanna be an engineer uh, Lipscomb is top notch, not only to make sure you have a skill set to be employed, but also that you have a heart for service and you can be a disciple your entire life uh, through the skill sets that you're learning. And then I did want to mention we uh, just announced recently that a New York Times columnist, David French, who you may have heard of, um, is a visiting professor with us. He will be visiting through our College of Leadership and Public Service. He happens to be an alum um, and he went through. Uh, the JAG program and was uh, an attorney at the U.S. level for many, many years. He is an expert in constitutional law, and he will be teaching some constitutional law courses for us. The reason I share this with you is that he'll be teaching as part of our lifelong learning program. And so folks can participate in lifelong learning without being a Lipscomb student. If you're 55 or above, you don't have to identify who you are. If you're 55 or above, you can participate for almost nothing. It's about $100, um, and you can take a course on a variety of topics with high-level people across the country, and David will be doing one around constitutional law and free speech and others, so I hope you will join, uh, join that. And then finally, we kicked off a strategic plan this past year. Um, it's called Impact 360, so we're starting year two. This is starting my third year of the strategic plan, second year. And we've had some phenomenal progress so far. Uh, we have done everything from ensuring that our student life is vibrant, uh, changing some things in our spiritual life components, to investing in our faculty and academic programs, and adding more and more health science programs. Uh, let me share, we are not planning to open a medical school. We have two medical schools now that will be in Middle Tennessee. 
but we are supporting all the allied health fields by continuing to open programs and grow programs in nursing, which we have 100% NCLEX pass rate, which is the nursing exam this past year, uh, PA program, perfusion program. Uh, we have programs in dietetics, exercise science, and we're looking at several more over the next couple of years. And then I want to end because it would be very important for me to say something about athletics. My athletic director would be sad if I didn't say something. Uh, Lipscomb is a Division I school. And as a Division I school, we have very high-level athletes that decide to come to our campus. Now, this past year, we won multiple ASUN tournament championships in baseball, in girls' golf for the first time ever. Um, and then we also won in track. And we had a for the last two years, a cross country runner that went to the NCAA tournament at the national level have placed. Uh, and then our basketball continues to get better and better. You don't want to miss this season. Uh, last year, we had a great wins in both women and men's basketball. And I'm, I'm already predicting even better uh, this year. Uh, so please come and see some of our division one teams play. Uh, you won't be disappointed. I'm gonna give you something as, you, as we end. <coughs> I have a document up here that is the Presidential Signature Series document and an alumni magazine. They basically say, join us for some events. But one I don't want you to miss is we will have an exhibit at Lipscomb from October 31 to December 9 that highlights 25 of Dolly Parton's best outfits. Her book, her new book is coming out. It's called My Life in Rhinestones. Life Between the Seams, S-E-A-M-S. It's very cute. And she talks about how her clothes have made her. And so we talk about the craft of her clothes and her outfits and how that made uh, her music even so much more powerful. And so come to see our exhibit, The Dolly Parton and the Makers, and it will be about the craft of her fashion. And we'll also have signed copies of her books and merchandise on campus. And these are other things. I'll just pop up here. Please grab a document where you can see these dates and hopefully you'll come join us on campus. And I could not help myself but to bring our latest alumni edition. You'll see our alums who are in, someone was talking about our new member in restaurants. We have a lot of alums who run eateries, Puffy Muffin, Martin's Barbecue, Donut Den, Party Fowl. They're all Lipscomb alums. And so it's an edition that shares a little bit about who our folks are and the different places that they run across the community. So I'll stop there and appreciate the opportunity to share a bit about Lipscomb. Dr. McQueen, we do have some time for some questions, if you would be willing to entertain some questions. So these items are up here. Just make sure you grab one of these. This is about our signature series. We'll hope you'll uh, visit in our magazine. All right, I'll take questions if there are any from the audience. <coughs> yes, sir. Well, interesting you asked. So the, there is a, you've probably heard a term potentially. Wall Street Journal writes about this a lot. New York Times has written about it. Uh, we have, we'll have a demographic cliff in 2025. That means after 2025, there are less college age students available to go to school because we have a change in birth rates. The only demographic that is, is, a, is sort of bucking that trend is the Latino population. Everybody else, we're going down in the number of children that we're having that will be available at the college level age. And so as a result of that, we're really having to think about alternative ways folks that are adults that have some kind of college education but never finished a degree can come back. So we're opening up lots of programs. That's why you see a lot of online programs, adult degree programs. What we're seeing in the community college space is that post-pandemic, folks did not choose to go back to school. Uh, we lost a lot of students during the pandemic at the community college level, and then we're just not seeing that uptick in the typical demographic. So we're having to be creative. The state's being creative with incentives for students to go to school. They already have free community college, but how can we incentivize them to actually work while they're in their community college so that they can be supported through that? Because a lot of students aren't going because they need to work and they can't figure out how they're going to do both. And so we're kind of recreating ourselves to be a campus that is attractive to people who work and have the ability uh, to do both. 
The challenge will be though that we're all going to face is that when you have fewer and fewer students that can actually go to college just because they're not available, we're all going to have to buckle down on our financial, our cost and um, our budgets. And you can see that if y'all been following the news about West Virginia University, go look that up. Gordon Gee, who used to be the chancellor at Vanderbilt, is now the president there. And they're cutting, I don't know, it was like 30 plus programs, 50 plus faculty members are cutting things like um, foreign languages. And they're doing that because they're so costly and yet they don't have a number of students to support what they're doing. So this is a real problem and I think we should all be paying attention to that story. Yes, sir. Yes, so vocational and career and technical schools, I'm a big fan. So when I was commissioner, I, I focused on that. In fact, we had more and more students that were just out of um, high school make a decision to go to a, a Votech school. An example of that is the typical technology center or what we would call our vocational centers now, um, our Tennessee tech centers, their average age is 26 years old. We shifted that when I was commissioner where the average age was 22 because we saw very few people coming right out of high school and going there. They would sit out, they would work, they'd be in part-time something, and then they would choose to go uh, potentially one day. But it is much easier if you make the decision right out of high school to go and you're earning potential is greater because you get a job much, much quicker. So I'm I'm very much in favor of what we do there and that Governor Lee has been a big supporter. Oh, um, yes. It seems like in the news, we're hearing so many things about elementary school introducing subjects that really don't support reading, writing, and arithmetic. And that's what we seem to focus on. Give me your thoughts on that. Yeah, I'd say two things, because um, that could go a lot of different directions in terms of what we're seeing in elementary schools. I do think we need to be particularly attentive to making sure our elementary schools, our middle schools, our high schools, and our colleges still focus on a strong interdisciplinary liberal arts education. Because the connections across disciplines that kids make help them become a thinker. Um, I've seen schools go to triple, and this is not a joke, double or triple periods of math. Well, the problem with that is you have to eliminate something. When you go to double or triple periods of math, they may become a better math student. That hopefully is why they're doing it. But the challenge is they're not getting science. They're not getting social studies. They're not getting some kind of art. They may not be getting foreign language. And all these things matter to make a well-rounded, thoughtful person who can connect dots at a young age. And the elementary school age and younger is when all the synapses are being built in your brain. I mean, brain research says if you are focused too narrowly on certain subjects at a young age, they won't build into uh, the critical thinker and problem solver that they need to be. So you've got to have science and social studies and depth of that thinking at the elementary school level. And I've got a school board member here I think would agree with me. Yes. So... The cost of college and universities now is is astounding. Uh, I I went to the briefly to the law school, University of Tennessee. It cost two hundred and fifty bucks a quarter. Now that was forty years ago, right. but it's today, nowhere near that now. Yeah, yeah. no, no, no. Yeah. I'm sure it's not. And it it could be you could spend half a million dollars going to college now. That's that's incredible. And it seems like the colleges are are kind of playing the system. They 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 index their tuition to the most money that they can get on student loans. It seems like a, a kind of a broken, uh, you know, self-feeding process. How, how do we break that? Yeah, great question. Um, great question. And one that college presidents um, and board members talk about a lot. Um, here's what's broken about it. What's broken is that students are typically never paying the rack rate. So just think about students that you know that have recently gone to college or if you just recently went to college. You're not paying what their tuition really is that it says it is. You're paying some discounted rate off of that. It's the weirdest thing in the world. You ever do that in anything else where let's say it's a $50,000 a year. Let's make that up. Your rent rarely ever, no one's really paying $50,000 a year. Most schools, I'm talking about if that's their rack rate, they get at least 30% off right off the top. They get some kind of academic scholarship, something will reduce that rack rate. And so for us, our discount rate off of whatever we advertise is 50%. So 
So whatever we say it is, it's 50% off. Well, that's an interesting model because you're probably building what you need, like the your academic buildings, your dorms, you're building it on whatever your tuition rate was, but you're having to discount to compete to get students. And by the way, everybody does it. The only few that don't would be Princeton and Harvard and Yale, which by the way, they already have endowments that give huge scholarships to students, right? right. So everybody's doing this. That is a broken model because you're building a budget on a tuition rate you think you need, but you discount everybody. And so that's why in higher education, we're all trying to figure out how do you share reality of what you really need to exist. Last year, we did something called zero-based budgeting. If you're in the, uh, any kind of CFO, you know that's really important to do periodically. We hadn't done it in years. And when we did zero-based budgeting, you learn what you really need to operate. And then you can recalibrate your system around what you really need to operate. And I would suggest every university across the country has to do some version of that. Uh, one of our problems is we keep getting higher and higher and higher. We keep adding new buildings, new programs, new things that students quite frankly don't necessarily need. It's a good to have, but it's not a must have. And so we're cutting things that you really don't need so you can bring that cost down. Um, I will say division one athletics is expensive, right? So if you're at a division one school that has a cost, but by the way, it enhances the student experience. Great dorms have a cost, but it enhances the student experience. So you're constantly trying to calibrate what's the student experience versus I wanna have a cost that's affordable where they don't have debt when they come out. And I am proud that we are a best value school. Uh, we've been a best value school for multiple years, which means our students have less debt than the average student um, because they are getting jobs and they are paying that down and their scholarship a good bit or discounted. So they don't pay that high rack rate that some universities have. But, great, but, great question. Last Thank question you. right here. Uh, as a new, <clears throat> as a new uh, university president, what was your biggest surprise and what are you most proud of in your three years? Wow. Um, I would say biggest surprise it is all positive. I knew that I would love this 18 to 24 year old age group. But remember, a lot of my career had been in K-12. Although I was uh, a college of education dean, I was still in schools, K-12 schools a lot, even with those pre-service teachers. So I'm spending a lot more time with 18 to 24 year olds. And you've heard a lot of people say, you know, this generation, they're a mess. Like, how are we going to make it? I would be the opposite. I just think this generation, at least the ones that are choosing to come to Lipscomb and have this mission orientation, are top notch. They really care about the future. They care about the mission uh, that they're coming to school for. They're going to be phenomenal workers. Now, they've got to work through things. We all do. Uh, but I'm really proud of this 18 to 24 uh, age group that I now get to work with. And I've been pleasantly surprised how impressed I have been with them because you have a notion of what that might look like coming in. And what was your other question? I've already forgotten it. Most proud of, you know, I am most proud of how our community really embraced some changes that really have helped our culture. Uh, you know, when you come in as a new leader, you've got to make change and any new leader will have to do that. And our, our community really embraced some of the changes that we needed to make, which was being more efficient, more effective really digging into student life and our academic programs. Uh, they've embraced that. And I've been, um, I think, most proud of how we are one community all working toward some goals together. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Dr. McQueen, thank you for being here. If I can get you to stay up here for just a minute. Um, our guest speaker is very humble. She kind of like kind of sped through it. But if you didn't notice, she did mention that it is the number one college of education in the state. Um, that is from a rich history of strong leadership. And prior to becoming the commissioner uh, for the Department of Education, Dr. McQueen was dean of the College of Education. So there is very strong leadership and, and it is a great community asset. And they're very fortunate to have you. Uh, thank you for being here. We have a gift that we would like to give. you. First, we have a pen that we would like to present to you so that you can remember your time here with us. Uh, and we ask that you use that pen to sign this book that we will read to first graders in our community here in Brentwood. Uh, and we will talk to them about your time here. So thank you. Wonderful, thank you.
Um, it was so great to see such a full room. Uh, Steve, Banks, Josh, Jay, Joey, Matt, Jeff, Lindsay, Jackson, Tim. Um, it was great to have you with us. I hope that you'll consider coming back and seeing us again. Uh, Jeff, as always, it's great to see you. Uh, I have a razor that I can help you with that the next time you come. But it, but it looks great on you. Um, it's a lot of jealousy. Uh, please help put tables and chairs away. We're stacking uh, in stacks of eight next to the tables. Uh, if there's nothing else for the good of Rotary, then we are adjourned. <laughs>